To die and then to be reborn as the son of your favorite pop idol, Oshinoko may seem like a colorful story of love and hope, but at its very core, it's a tragic tale of revenge. A wonderfully animated, beautifully told, tragic tale of revenge. The first episode was over 90 minutes long and it just felt like I was watching a movie. Yet the anime adaption is euphoric and the story is phenomenal. Well, it's by the author of Kaguya-sama after all. As always, this will be my brief recap of the series. Well then, let's see what we have. There's a guy named Goro Amamiya. He's a laid-back doctor who has no problem with watching his favorite idol, Ai Hoshino, in a patient's room. Why is a working adult, a proper member of society, into an underage idol, you might ask? Well, this goes back to four years ago when he had a patient named Serena. She was pale and frail, only 12 years old, and already spending all her days in the hospital. Though she was really into Ai Hoshino. And so after she unfortunately passed away, the doctor sort of inherited her love for I. Now, that's all sad and bittersweet, but imagine the doctor's surprise when the next patient he has to examine turns out to be the very same 16-year-old idol, Ai Hoshino. And guess what? She's pregnant. He surprisingly manages to keep himself composed. Ai is a refreshing, larger-than-life, energetic girl. It seems she'll be having twins, and although her manager has his reservations, she wants to have the kids. She wants to continue her career as an idol as well. Later, at the roof, as the doctor is processing his thoughts, Ai shows up. He reveals that he already knows her real identity, and so Ai decides to share her story, as there is no point in trying to hide anymore. Raised as an orphan, she always wanted to have her own family, and that's why she's definitely having the kids, and she'll continue on with her career as an idol as well. The entertainment industry is built on lies, after all, she'll just keep the kids a secret. In reply, the doctor reassures her that he'll make sure that she gives birth to healthy babies and that there's nothing for her to worry about during the pregnancy. Fast forward to the day I is due, the doc is on his way home when he encounters a shady guy wearing a hood. Turns out this person knows that I is pregnant. This leads the doc to chasing him because that's meant to be a secret. But as fate would have it, he pushes him off the cliff and, well, the doc dies. He dies before he could actually help I with the delivery. I goes into labor around the same time. Luckily, someone else did do the delivery and so two healthy children were born. At that moment, the doc also opens his eyes as the son of his favorite idol. His name is Aquamarine, and his twin sister's name is Ruby. I herself confuses the two of them all the time, so I guess she's still just a goofy klutz. His sister Ruby is also someone who has been reborn. Just between you and me, she's the 12-year-old girl, Serena, who died four years ago. The kids will be getting taken care of by the manager's wife, Miyako. It seems she has her reservations, and I eventually goes back to work, performing on stage. One day, when Miyako has had enough of this babysitting, she wonders if she should just give the story about how Ai Hoshino has kids to a publisher for money and start a new life. The twins surprise her using human speech, convincing her that they're actually gods, communicating to her through the children, and, well, they require her cooperation. Ai Hoshino is God's favorite, after all. Miyako has promised that if she pampers the twins, she'll eventually be able to remarry. This time, it'll be a handsome young man. As time continues to pass, the twins begin to learn more and more about the harshness of the entertainment industry. The low pay, plus there's always so much hate from random nobodies on the internet. But then, one day, when Aqua is old enough to casually speak, his acting abilities are noticed by a film director, who offers Ai Hoshino in one of his films, as long as he stars as well. He obliges and surprises everyone by his immaculate performance, especially another child actor named Kana Arima. She has a lot of confidence in her own abilities and was highly skeptical that Aqua was on the same level. Little did she know, hiding in that tiny body was a grown-ass man. From that day forward, Kana starts seeing Aqua as her rival for life. Two years later, when the film is finally released, it is a big success. Ai Hoshino's popularity skyrockets and she becomes a major sensation in the entertainment sphere. It's been four years since she gave birth. Aqua and Ruby are now four years old, and Ai's career is blooming with each passing day. All is good. Life is good. But on the day of her first major Tokyo Dome performance, the same guy who killed the duck four years ago shows up at their doorstep and rings the bell. Ai rushes to open it, thinking it's the manager, but no is that creepy stalker. She stabs her right there and then and accuses her of lying to her fans. Though even so, I not only remembered his name, she also expressed how she's still trying to love her fans. This gives the guy some serious mental concussions. He cannot cope with the fact that he's complete human garbage, so he runs away. 
As for I, it's not too late for her. And Aqua, a former doctor, can see that. Ruby also listens from the other side of the door as I tells her kids that she loves them and passes away. It's a horribly sad, bittersweet, and pretty tragic moment. However, be that as it may, in her final moment, I was smiling. She smiled because at the very least, the love she had for her kids was genuine. That complete human garbage who stabbed her ends up committing die as well. A funeral takes place and the public soon forgets about Ai. In fact, there are some disgusting comments by her haters on the internet. Miyako, the manager's wife, who had been taking care of Ruby and Aqua all this time, formally adopts the kids. Over the years, she started seeing them as her own kids. Ruby resolves herself to walk the same path as her mother. She'll become an idol. While Aqua is finding a reason to live out of nowhere, it suddenly springs in his head. The stalker knew about the hospital, and he knew about Ai's residence. How? Someone leaked information to him, and considering how they haven't met their father yet, their perpetrator is most likely to be him. Yes, Aqua can't die yet. He has to kill his father first. Fast forward to 10 years later. It's the first day of high school for Aqua and Ruby. Ruby has the same kind of energy as I, while Aqua is reading to set his revenge plan into motion. Moving on, in the years following Ai's death, her manager fell out of contact. Her idol group was disbanded, and Miyako also had to close down their agency, the Strawberry Production. She started focusing on internet personalities instead. Ruby gave plenty of auditions, but none of her efforts had borne any fruit yet. Little did she know, her brother Aqua had been going around and using his acting skills to make it so she doesn't get accepted anywhere. He doesn't want her to be an idol. The entertainment industry is a curse. But still, when Ruby gets scouted by a shady, underground idol group, it becomes exceedingly clear that she isn't giving up. So, left with no choice, Miyako decides to reopen Strawberry Productions' idol unit with Ruby as their main star. At least, she'll be with them. This is safer than any other agency getting a hold of her. As for Aqua, he's been working as that director's apprentice all this time. However, his main goal isn't to become an actor. It's to get closer to everyone in the industry so that he can find his father and kill him. This is why when he explains that he wants to work behind the scenes, the director gives him a push. Let's see if it works. Later, Aqua and Ruby are accepted into the Yoto High School, a prestigious academy that has a renowned arts department. They go and check it out when Aqua encounters a familiar face. It's Kana, the girl he worked with all those years ago, the self-proclaimed rival of Aqua Hoshino. You can probably imagine her surprise when she realizes that her rival is enrolled in the general education department and not performing arts. She wants him to get back into acting, and even offers him a role in the live-action adaption of a manga series called Sweet Today. Now, Aqua had no interest, but when she mentions the name of the producer, he quickly realizes that he was on Ai's secret contact list. Yes, since this meant personal business, he has to give it a go. He wants to get closer to that producer and see if he's the man he's been looking for. He'll play the villain's role, but come game time, he realizes that the show's quality is almost laughably poor. Well, I guess that's exactly the level of production you can expect when it comes to live-action adaptations of popular anime or manga series. <sighs> it's sad. Though I'm hearing good things about One Piece. Kana tells him that she's well aware that the other actors are only good when it comes to how they look. Their acting ability is insulting. She herself is also holding back when it comes to her own skills because if she overshadows them, it could lead to some bad blood. That's why she couldn't advance her career much as a child, after all. She must not overshadow others. Anyway, Aqua picks up the producer's cigarettes to get them checked and see if they share the same DNA. But during this, he also overhears him talk about how he's just taking advantage of Kana. This obviously doesn't sit right with him, so he decides to make the production a success for Kana's and his career's sake. He uses his brilliant acting skills to control other people's actions as well, sort of wheel them in, and make it so Kana is free to go all out with her acting. This results in a much better and much more genuine scene, and although it doesn't make up for all the other poor scenes, it does make the final scene watchable, at the very least. Plus, since Kana was able to demonstrate her true skills, she'll get more work in the future. The author of that manga was basically in depression because of the rest of the production, but this acceptable last scene made her smile. Aqua has a brief meeting with the producer. This time, he knows that the man is not his father, so he just wants to learn more from him. He asks about if there was someone close to Ai Hoshino. And the producer does know someone, but Aqua will have to star in a dating show to learn more. 
So the time comes when Aqua and Ruby attend their first day at Yoto High School. Ruby awkwardly becomes friends with a gravure model named Minami Kotobuki, and she is super laid back. Ruby then introduces her to Aqua and then talks about another student in her class named Frill Shiranui. This one is an entertainer. Frill is able to easily recognize both Aqua and Minami because she's familiar with those in the industry, and this gives our girl Ruby a little bit of self-consciousness because unlike them, she still doesn't have a place in the entertainment industry, not an established one at least. So back at home, she wants Miyoko to move things along with their idol group, but it isn't easy, is it? However, what if Aqua suggests she recruit Kana Arima? Kana obviously has her reservations, she isn't sure about risking her acting career to become an idol, but she signs up with the Strawberry Productions. Well, it's her chance to work with Aqua after all. Who'd miss that? Even I'd want to work with the absolute Chad Rizzler of a man that is Aqua Hoshino. But then again, when she learns that he'll be starring in a reality dating show called My Love with a Star Begins Now, not to mention he'll be with the fashion model named Yuki Sumi, the dancer Nobuyuki Kumano, and the actress Akane Kurokawa, the internet personality Memcho, and the musician Kengo Morimoto, all big names in the industry, and the girls are just straight up bombshells. Kana's kind of jealous. Lucky for her, Aqua has no interest whatsoever in any of those girls. He's there for one reason and one reason alone, to get more information about people who were close to Ai Hoshino. Subsequently, Strawberry Productions Idol Unit is ready for Ruby and Kana to debut online. They get some help from one of these seasoned internet personalities, a masked physical training guy named Payon. The girls weren't very sure about him, but when they realized that he makes 100 million yen per year, there was no way the girls wouldn't accept him as their master. He advises them to collaborate with already established channels, such as his channel. And so the training arc begins. It's a one hour long workout to get their dance bones already. Kana lasts the entire hour, which makes Ruby respect her even more. As for what the girls will be naming their channel, it's going to be B Komachi. Yep, I Hoshino's band will be making a comeback from the dead. As for Aqua and his reality dating show, he's taken aback by how authentic and genuine these reality shows are. There's no script, just actors and their ability. Meanwhile, Kana and Ruby continue their grind. Kana tells Ruby about how important it is for a star to manage their appearance and reputation online. One mistake and people will burn you at the stake. Back to the dating show, there's a love triangle going on between Yuki, Nobuyuki, and Kengo. Why isn't Aqua in the triangle? Well, it just isn't like him. He doesn't want to draw more attention to himself, so instead of going for Yuki, who's already getting attention, or Memcho, who has a ridiculous number of subscribers, Aqua decides to try his shot with Akane, a silent beauty who hasn't had much screen time in the show yet. This is getting to her. She even ends up slapping Yuki on film after losing her cool. Well, if she doesn't get results, her agency will be at her throat. However, this backfires. Yuki may forgive her, but what about the internet? Yuki's fans have come after her online and try to bring her reputation down. Negative comments, hate, memes, trolls. At one point, it became too much for Akane to handle, but taking her own life seemed like the only escape. So there she was at a pedestrian overpass, ready to jump to end it all. Fortunately, Aqua saw this coming. He shows up before it's too late. A police officer shows up too, and soon enough, right as Ruby and Kana are talking about how often celebrities take their own lives because of harassment, Miyako receives a call that Aqua is at the police station. The anxiety starts to go straight through the roof. At the police station, we see Akane bawling beside her mother. She finally lets it all out. Soon, the rest of the cast of Lone Now also enters the chat. The first thing Yuki does is that she slaps Akane. She slaps her and then hugs her. It's rightfully dramatic, to say the least. But at least they're even now. Aqua then asks Akane what she wants to do. She can step down from the show. That's one way of going about things. But because she doesn't want everyone's efforts going to waste, she states that she will stick around to the very end. Of course, the others support the decision. But how is Aqua planning on resolving this. He's actually pretty disgusted at the staff for purposefully making Akane out to be the villain of the show with the way they edited the footage. He reveals the news about Akane's suicide attempt to the police and declares that the real reality show begins now. Seriously, what is this bro planning on doing? Basically, he wants to make a video that redoes the scene where Akane slaps Yuki. Aqua personally goes up to the director to get the scene where Yuki hugs Akane because they were purposefully hiding it. And well, let's just say he gaslights the director into having his way. In the end, the video they do is a major success and Akane's reputation stabilizes once again. The next question is, how is Akane going to handle the show from here on out? Memcho and Aqua tell her to play a character so that she doesn't take things personally. As they're saying this, Aqua's the only guy in the room, so the girls ask him about his ideal girl. 
As expected, Aqua describes Hoshino Ai, fully believing that Ai is not someone who can be imitated. Now, Akane herself was pretty grateful to Aqua for what he did, so she spends the night gathering information, analyzing Ai, and learning about her characteristic quirks. She's so good at it that she ends up nailing down Ai's personality and history to the last minute detail. It's pretty scary. And the next time the filming takes place, she shows up to their set in her Ai impression. Everyone is pulled in by her energy, especially Aqua. He is stunned. When Yuki and Memcho start pestering him about what he thinks about Akane now, our boy gets flustered, turns red, and tells them to stop before running off on his own. This causes Akane to snap out of her character as well because she wasn't expecting such a response from Aqua. The girls ask her if she'd be willing to date Aqua for real, and it seems she isn't against it. And with that, that's it. The excitement returns to the show. When Ruby watches her performance, she is reminded of her mother. Aqua, on the other hand, experiences a bit of an existential crisis. What is his relationship with Ai? Is he her son, her fan, or something else? He skips school with Kana and has a little talk with her. It helps him sort of sort out his feelings. And he also learns that he isn't really romantically interested in Kana herself, but considering how skilled she is at imitating, she can be of good use for him. That's why, during the final episode of Love Now, he plunges forward and passionately kisses Akane on camera. Of course, our girl Kana is annoyed, but to be fair, Aqua is just too deep into the Sigma male grind set. He isn't interested in either of them. He only has his mind on revenge. Now that the show is over, there is a party during which Akane and everyone discusses relationships as well as whether she and Aqua will be going out now. As for Aqua, he talks with producer Kaburagi about business, which in this context is just a conversation about I. Following this, Aqua and Akane agree to start dating for professional reasons, and then everyone leaves. Aqua and Memcho live close to each other though, they chit chat on the way, and Aqua comments that she knows a lot about B. Komachi. Memcho confesses to not only being an idol fan, but also wanting to be one herself. And so in the wake of this, Aqua invites her to be a member of the new B. Komachi. She's a bit surprised by this, and even thinks Aqua is joking. But when he takes her to the place and introduces her to Miyako, things start looking real. The good news is that Memcho's current contract won't be a problem for her to take up any other jobs, but looks like that's not going to be the real problem Miyako has on her mind. She just straight up asks it like it is. Memcho is lying about her age. There's a bit of back and forth, but Miyako understands if she's a couple of years older. The problem is that it's not just a couple of years, she's actually 25. Now, being an idol when you're 25, that sounds illegal, somehow. She explains how she had to support her sick mother and siblings, and by the time she could give becoming an idol an actual shot, she was already 23 years old. So instead, she lied about being a high school student online and started streaming. But whatever. Ruby and Kana warmly welcome her into the game. Yes, Memcho becomes a part of the new B. Kamachi. And thanks to the new popularity of the Love Now show, B. Kamachi gets some eyes as well, because Memcho was part of the show. Well, Aqua was too, and so he's in the spotlight as well. B. Kamachi is going to reuse some of the band's old songs to give a performance, and so the training arc begins. But Kana isn't really in her element. She's a bit cold to Ruby and Memcho, and a bit jealous because of Aqua's recent surge in popularity. Aqua comments that if she keeps it up, even he will get hurt. Which, of course, gets to Kana because the poor girl is in love with him. After meeting with the producer again, Aqua decides that he'd secure a spot for them in the upcoming Japan Idol Festival, so that B. Kamachi can revive for real. But the question is, who is going to be the group's center? Ruby and Memcho both want it, but Kana isn't interested. She beats herself down and undermines her abilities. However, when they try to look into her music career, both Ruby and Memcho realize how handful the girl is. If she's feeling insecure with this level of abilities, she'd really be a handful. Hence, despite her wishes, it is decided. Kana is going to be the center. It's not like she had a choice, the other two are simply too terrible at singing compared to her. Miyako once again invites Peon to teach them a thing or two. You know, the guy who can spend like a million yen on a coffee just on a Tuesday. He trains them to build their stamina and adjusts their dance movements. When they're done with a training session, Kana steps out to take a breath. This is where Peon asks her if she regrets becoming an idol. He asks very sincerely, so she replies honestly. She still doubts that she can be an idol, or a center for that matter, but just talking it out with him makes her feel a lot better. In fact, she actually considers falling for him over Aqua. But as fate would have it, Ruby and Memcho notice that Pion's physique today is looking a lot like Aqua's physique. Yep, you guessed it, it was Aqua pretending to be Pion. Kana goes on to talk about Aqua with Memcho, how he left a strong impression on her back when they were kids, but he is such a pain. Aqua talks to Pion on the phone about the progress, and Pion compliments Aqua for being able to handle this on his own. This does make you wonder though, why is Aqua pretending to be someone else in the first place? It's because he knows that Kana isn't the mood to listen to him. 
All right, so it's the night before the big event. Just like a child would stay awake right before a school trip, Ruby struggles to sleep at night. She's pretty excited. When Kana asks her about her overwhelming positivity, Ruby tells the story about how she used to be stuck in the hospital all day, every day. What saved her from that was Ai Hosino and the idea of becoming an idol. She does eventually pass out though, and Kana heads downstairs. Well, she just happens to see Pion's mask and gets curious about what he looks like underneath. She hides herself to catch a peek, only to realize that it was Aqua in the first place. This confuses her about everything Pion said to her, just how much of it was true, and how much of it was just Aqua gaslighting her. She starts overthinking and hardly gets any sleep. Then it's the day of the Japanese Idol Festival. Yes, time for the girls to shine brightly on the stage. Miyako takes them there, and it looks like all the idol groups are confined to one big space, where they have to change and prepare and everything. Kana feels pressure as usual and even starts remembering her failures. No doubt about it, she's nervous, just like Ruby is nervous. However, Ruby assures her that it'll be alright. They're still noobs anyway, so with that, Kana embraces her status as a noob and embraces herself to go wild on stage. Next, the performance begins. There's quite a large audience. Most of them are Memcho's YouTube subscribers though, but Ruby begins to draw them in as well. Before you know it, she's drawing their attention with a charm similar to that of Ai Hoshino. She hits a lot of fans as well. Again, this causes Kana to get a little insecure. She's the center, but no one is watching her. Well, that's when her eyes coincidentally spot someone raising a white silume somewhere in the audience. It's Aqua. He dances around and waves all three colors to show support for all three of them. Watching him makes Kana realize how silly everything is, so she changes her motivation. She's going to use this opportunity to surpass the other two and also win Aqua's heart. Well, good luck with that. All in all, the performance is a massive success, and as they're on their way back, Kana finally learns that Aqua's relationship with Akane is only for work, and nothing more. Good, she can finally relax. Memcho is an adult, so she quickly concludes that Kana has eyes for Aqua. The following day, Kana asks Aqua about why he disguised himself as Payan. He says that it was just because she wouldn't talk to him. Kana teases him about it, but for what it's worth, Ruby's glad that they're on good terms again. Meanwhile, producer Kabaraki meets a guy named Sumiyaki Raida to go over the production of an upcoming stage play. It's going to be an adaptation of a popular manga series called Tokyo Blade. The purpose of this meeting is for Rita to get some young and good-looking actors for the cast. Later, there's a date. A work date, if you will. Both Aqua and Akane talk about how they're going to be part of the Tokyo Blade project. Their roles are going to be that of an established couple in the manga. But there's another love interest type character in the story for Aqua's character. Akane wonders who will be playing that. That's when Kana enters the chat and reveals that it will be her. And Aqua notices something. It's impossible to miss. He realizes that Kana and Akane are out for blood. And I guess that's pretty much it for the first season of Oshinoko. The lead producer is pleased with the idea of casting Kana and Akane as they both share a unique dynamic. The play is going to be great, he just knows it. As for Ruby and Aqua, Ruby visits her mother's grave while Aqua swears that he will definitely find their father. And that's where season one ends. Do check out the actual anime if you haven't already, guys. It is pretty phenomenal. It's simply beautiful. And that is the end of the video. As always, if you liked what you saw, subscribe to the channel. I will be uploading a lot of videos just like this. So I'll see you at the next one. And hey, really quick, for those of you who are still here, if you get the chance, please check out my stream. Link in the description. This month I'm doing charity live streams to raise some money for the uh, Virginia Bicycling Foundation. Um, my father died in a bicycle accident about two years ago, and uh, every year in September I've been trying to raise money in his name. So if you get the chance, stop by. We'll be playing games and just trying to have a good time. Hope you guys have a wonderful evening, and stay safe out there.